this morning, going around the campus, which is highly impressive, and the visit was really rewarding. To be frank with you, I have not come here with any prepared speech. I thought <coughs> it would be better if I share with you my experience and learnings in handling two of the most important infrastructure projects this country has seen after independence. These two projects are the Congan Railway and the Delhi Metro. <laughs> Why I selected these two projects for speaking, for <clears throat> discussing in, in with you is there are very many lessons for the whole country to learn from these from the implementation of these two projects. Konkan Railway, as you may be aware, is a 760 kilometer long <coughs> broad gauge railway line from Mumbai to Mangalore along the west coast of the country called the Konkan Coast. That is why it's called the Konkan Railway. This line passes through one of the most difficult terrains ever encountered in the history of railway construction in our country. This will be evident to you when I mention for constructing this 760 kilometer long railway line, as many as 93 tunnels for an aggregate length of 83.5 kilometers had to be bored through one of the most difficult and adverse soil conditions in the country, the Western Guards. <clears throat> the longest tunnel on this is about 6.5 kilometers, and there are nine tunnels more than three kilometers. The soil conditions are so adverse, they are typical lateritic formations, which are very hard on the surface. But as you go down, it becomes very loose and almost like toothpaste when you bore through. Such soil conditions were to construct these tunnels. Then there were 158 major bridges to be completed. In railway parlance, a major bridge means which has got more than 20 meters in length. That's a major bridge. The longest bridge on this line <clears throat> is about two kilometers long across Sharaudi River near Karwa. <clears throat> and the highest viaduct, because the terrain is so undulating, many ravines could be crossed only by high viaducts. The highest viaduct was near Ratnagiri, is near Ratnagiri, and the piers of this viaduct is as tall as Kutub Minar, about 68 meters, more than 68 meters high. Kutub Minar is 71 meters, is 68 meters high. And then there were more than 160, uh, 1,600 minor bridges. Some of the embankments were as high as 25 meters. In fact, there is one stretch of an embankment which is about three kilometers long and about 25 meters high. You can imagine the difficult terrain. And the cuttings were also very, very deep, 30, 35 meters deep cuttings. The reason why, in spite of this difficult terrain, which we decided to go for a railway line which will have a speed potential of 160 kilometers per hour. In fact, Congo Railway is the only line in this country which can run trains at 160 kilometers per hour. 
As you are aware, all our trains, the maximum speed is only 110 kilometers, except for Rajdhani Express or Shadadi Express, which operate at 120 kilometers or 130 kilometers respectively. But that's not due to the railway line, that is because of the special capability of the trains. Common railway can operate trains at 160 kilometers because the curves are very, very <coughs> flat. A curve sharper than 1,000 meters means you require, all curves have to be more than 1,000 meters if you have to run trains at 160 kilometers. <coughs> and Congaret has been constructed with that. That is why you find very high embankments, very deep cuttings. Apart from the technical challenges in building this line, the most <coughs> difficult challenge was raising the money for the project. In our country, generally all railway lines are constructed with funds provided by the government of India through successive railway projects, railway budgets. And Congress was such a long line costing very heavy investments, needing very heavy investments. If it is reconstructed in the normal fashion, railway will not be able to provide the funds required for it even for in 25 years. Therefore, a very innovative funding system was planned for this project. And that was, <coughs> the government would give only one third of the cost of the project. And two thirds of the cost of the project had been borrowed from the market. For which purpose the Congress Railway Corporation was formed. It's a public sector undertaking under the Ministry of Railways. And I had the privilege of being the first chairman and managing director. In fact, I registered the company to start with. <laughs> the, the ownership of this company is very unique. The railways held only 51% of the share of this company, and the remaining 49% shares are held by the five state governments along the road. Maharashtra, Goa, Karnataka, I'm sorry, four state governments, and Kerala. Even though not even an inch of this railway line is in Kerala, Kerala government came forward to be a shareholder in this company because Kerala realized that if this line is constructed, the biggest beneficiary will be Kerala. That is what Kerala government became part of this company. <laughs> Initially, we were very enthusiastic. We thought we could raise the funds from the market easily. But unfortunately, there was a time when there was a complete uphill in the capital market of the country following the Harshit Mehta scam. I don't know whether many of you may not remember it. The capital market simply went dry, and it was very difficult for us to raise money in the market. In spite of all these technical challenges and the financial problems that we faced, we were able to complete this 760 kilometer long railway line in exactly seven years. I don't think this country has seen a railway line be constructed in such a short time. <laughs> in such difficult terrain conditions. The other project is the Delhi Metro. For information, Delhi Metro is not the first metro in the country. That distinction goes to Calcutta, where a 17 kilometers long metro line was commenced in early 70s, 1970s, but got completed only in 1994. I had 
the opportunity to be part of the Calcutta Metro as well. In the early stages of its investigation and design. But I was not involved in the implementation of the project. That project <coughs> was planned and executed by Indian Railways as a departmental project. The Calcutta Metro was not a very pleasant experience either for the city of Calcutta or for the country as a whole because the 17 kilometers of metro line took 22 years for completion and the cost went up by 14 times. But still, when the construction was going on, the Calcutta city was had to undergo many inconveniences and dislocations. The main central avenue was just cut open and kept like that for cut and cover construction for years and years. You can imagine <coughs> the inconvenience and dislocation that would have caused the city as a whole. In fact, seeing the experience of Calcutta Metro, many of the metropolitan organizations set up for constructing similar metros in Delhi, Mumbai, and Chennai. They all backed out, saying that we don't want to start a metro construction in this country anymore. That was the experience of Calcutta Metro. With this background only, the Delhi Metro was planned. Seeing the experience of Calcutta Metro, which was done by the Indian Railways as a departmental work, it was decided that Delhi Metro would be implemented in a different, entirely different style by a government company for which Delhi Metro Rail Corporation was formed with 50% participation by Government of India and 50% participation by government of Delhi. I also had the privilege of registering this company and forming the Delhi Metro Corporation. The first phase of Delhi Metro, which covered about 65 kilometers in length, with about 16 kilometers underground and remaining as elevated, was handed over to DMRC, Delhi Metro Rail Corporation, with the mandate that the first phase should be completed in 10 years' time, as envisaged in the detailed project report prepared for that project. I had the unique opportunity <coughs> to be the first managing director of Delhi Metro Rail Corporation. <coughs> when I took over Delhi Metro, I was still having the responsibilities of Kongan Railway that was not completed. But I was forced to take over Delhi Metro even before completing the Kongan Railway. And for about three to four months, I was in charge of both these major projects. The first thing we realized was Delhi being the capital city of the country and exploding with population. The city cannot wait for 10 years to get the first metro. That is the first thing we realized. And we decided that we would compress the implementation period from 10 years to 7 years. Ladies and gentlemen, it was possible for us to complete the first phase of Delhi Metro in exactly 7 years and 3 months, which is <laughs> 2 years and nine months ahead of schedule set by the government. What is more important, the first phase of the project was completed exactly within the estimated cost of 10,500 crores. <laughs> Seeing the success of implementing the Delhi Metro first phase, the government immediately sanctioned the second phase of Delhi Metro which covered 124 kilometers at a cost of 24,000 crores 
and to be completed in six years' time. They set a target of six years for completing the second phase of the Delhi Metro. By the time the country had the opportunity to stage the Commonwealth Games, and the government was very particular that the second phase of Delhi Metro should be completed before the Commonwealth Games are staged in Delhi which gave us exactly four years and six months for completing the second phase of Delhi Metro. Ladies and gentlemen, I am very proud to inform you that we were able to complete 124 kilometers of metro line, costing 24,000 crores, in exactly four years and six months. As a matter of fact, the last line, line number six of Delhi Metro, was commissioned on the very morning when the Commonwealth Games were staged. So precisely we were able to complete it, exactly on time. Of course, seeing the success of Delhi Metro phase two, the phase three, phase three has been sanctioned, and that is now nearing completion, it's going on well. Now, why I mention these two projects? And I, why I describe this in great detail? Is to tell you that both the projects were done by government organizations, government companies. And necessarily, being government companies, we have to follow the governmental rules, governmental procedures, and governmental guidelines. How is that, following all these things, these projects could be completed well in time or before time, and always within the estimated cost. This is a lesson that the country has to take from these two projects, which is the one that I want to discuss with you. What is the lesson that we can learn from these two projects? Ladies and gentlemen, this was possible only because of the unique work culture of these two organizations. The Congan Railway Corporation Limited and the Delhi Metro Rail Corporation. These two organizations, the unique work culture of these two organizations. And the cardinal pillars of this work culture are basically only four. <coughs> I would like the students to note down this principle because this will be the inspiration or guidance for you in your later professional career. These are one, punctuality, two, integrity, three, professional competence, and four, social <coughs> accountability. These are the four pillars of this work culture. I would like to dwell on these <coughs> aspects of the work culture in little more detail <coughs> for the sake of the young students present here. First of all, <coughs> punctuality. What is punctuality? <coughs> punctuality is nothing but a criticism that you show to others is nothing but this respect and regard that you have for the time of others. And for us, punctuality meant not a minute early, nor a minute late. I was so happy and impressed to see Dr. Sievertson organizing this function exactly Exactly a nine zero zero. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, punctuality is required not only really in our day to day life, the way we conduct our professional activities, but it's also required for completing the project on time. In major projects of this time, 
of this type. Time is money. Even one day late means it costs quite a lot to the nation. For example, we realize that phase one of Delhi Metro, if it is delayed by one day, that would need Delhi Metro Rail Corporation to mobilize another 1.3 crores extra to complete the project on time. And for phase two, which costs 24,000 crores, one day delay means another 4.5 crores for, the, for DMRC. It is so important, the time is so important. That is why I said time is money in projects of this type. Apart from that, unless you have this philosophy of <coughs> keeping to time, you will not be able to complete the project on time. In all these projects, I used to keep what is known as a reverse crock in the offices at the important work sites. These crocks will show how many days are left for completing that particular work or the complete phase, that particular phase of the work. And each day, automatically, the clock will show one day less. So this clock used to be a constant reminder to all the engineers, to the contractors, to the suppliers, that only so many days are left for finishing that part of the project, whether it's a tunnel, whether it's a major bridge, or whether it's a section to be commissioned. This kept us all the time on our toes. Punctuality is also required from some other reason as well. Most of these projects are meant for running trains, Congan Railway as well as Delhi Metro. And we realize that if we want our train to run punctually, we must be punctual ourselves. When we talk, this is very essential. Unless we are punctual, we expect our trains to be punctual. And see the outfall, the fallout of this philosophy. Take the example of Delhi Metro. Delhi Metro today runs 3,300 trains a day. World over, the punctuality of metro trains is reckoned with a least count of three minutes. World over, whether it is Japan, Washington, or London. A train is within three minutes arrival time, which is treated as punctuality. But Delhi Metro, we decided that we would tighten our belts and the least count from punctuality will be 60 seconds, one minute. <laughs> if a train is later than 60 seconds, then there's lost punctuality. Ladies and gentlemen, do you know the punctuality performance of Delhi Metro trains? I was, there, I was there about four days back in Delhi and I made inquiries to Delhi Metro, what is the punctuality performance? They told me it is 99.97%. <laughs> that is the importance of punctuality in an engineer's profession. You have to be very punctual all the time. And my dear young friends, I learned this punctuality <coughs> habit only from my engineering college. I had a professor called Dr. Dr. Uh, professor Sitabadi. He was not a doctor, he was Professor Sitabadi. He was a stickler for punctuality. He used to come to the classes for lectures, but we'll be standing outside the veranda till 9.15. If the classes start at 9.15, we'll be just standing outside. Exactly 9.15, he will enter the class. And 10 o'clock when the class is over, he'll close down. Exactly on time. He always used to insist that punctuality means not one minute early or one minute late. Not only in official <coughs> really or official functions or official classes, even private social functions, he used to carry these punctuality very strictly. And that's a habit both in Congan Railway as well as Delhi Metro. Even a social gathering, 
this punctuality is to be <coughs> observed very, very strictly. And by being punctual, you know, you save so much of time for everyone. Supposing now this function, I had come five minutes late. And you are say about <coughs> thousand students here. How many man hours would have lost? Just by being five minutes late. For an engineer, this would be a gospel, a Bible, being very, very punctual. The second, mat second <coughs> item I mentioned was integrity. What is integrity? Integrity is not just honesty or absence of corruption. It is something more than that. If you take the Oxford Dictionary and see the meaning of integrity, it will, see, it will say having, high, having good moral values. This is integrity. As well as the Delhi Metro. We were very, very particular about the integrity of every individual who joined this organization. I used to personally screen <coughs> the officers and the staff who entered the organization. We had a very, very lean organization. Not a huge organization that you find generally with construction uh, <coughs> corporations. Very lean organization. But one thing we are very particular is about integrity of the person. And if we suspected the integrity of any particular individual, he was out of the organization the next day. We never booked, we never condoned any sort of <coughs> illegal transactions or illegal gains being obtained by anyone. We never allowed that. These two organizations had such a high reputation for integrity all the time. Even today, they have this high reputation. For the Commonwealth Games <coughs> stage in Delhi, October 2010, there were very many players contributing to the Commonwealth Games infrastructure. And DMRC was only one of them, of course the biggest player. Were all the organizations involved in the Commonwealth Games, there were very many allegations. Even the top man, Mr. Kalmani, you know, he had to be even arrested, he was put behind bars. Everybody had a lot of allegations. And DMRC was the biggest player with 24,000 crores of project in hand. There was not even one single allegation against DMRC. <laughs> This is the credit that you get having the reputation for integrity. My young friends, integrity should be the passport in your pocket wherever you go. Your reputation for integrity should go ahead of you wherever you work. If you have a good reputation for integrity, even if you make a mistake, that will not be treated as a mistake, that will be pardoned. There will be no investigations. This reputation for integrity is very, very important for any individual. Mind you, both these projects, Congo Railway as well as Delhi Metro, they were handed over to me after my retirement from Indian Railways in 1990. The government had no hold on me except my pension. Why did the government entrust Mr. Sridhar in with huge projects of this type involving such thousands of crores only because the reputation I had for integrity. This is... <laughs> this is very important for any engineer, whether you are a civil engineer, whether you are an electronics engineer, electrical engineer, for any engineering profession, this <coughs> integrity is very, very important. Integrity should be the crown stone in the arts of your character. <coughs> it, is, it is so important. If you are very honest, you have the courage to take decisions, 
You have the courage to face politicians. You have the, you have the courage <coughs> to stand up to anyone. If you are not honest, you will not have any of these qualities. And that is one of the hallmarks of my career, this integrity. It's so important. The third aspect of the work culture I mentioned to you was about professional competence or technical competence. You can understand these two projects that I mentioned, congruently how technically complex it was. Delhi Metro was an entirely different type of complexity. This country had not done, had not executed, had not even planned a world class metro so far. Calcutta Metro was very mediocre metro, very behind, very behind in technology. Even today, Calcutta Metro technology is at least 20 years behind. Calcutta Metro, even today, the maximum speed is only 60 kilometers. It has none of the <coughs> requirements of a modern metro. If you have, want to handle this project, you must know how to handle it. It's not that you should know everything about the project. If you don't know, you can hire people to execute the project. When we started Delhi Metro, of course, Congo Railway, I had known this problem because all the people I had brought from Indian Railways, they were all very competent, and we did not look to any foreign technology at all in Congo Railway construction. Whereas Delhi Metro, this country had not done a world class metro at all. There is no precedence, there is no example. Therefore, we had to hire foreign experts, foreign consultants to assist us in planning and implementing the first phase of the metro. But we did it only in the first phase. By the time the first phase was completed, we have mastered the tricks of the trade. Thereafter, phase two, phase three, we were able to do ourselves. Why? Only Delhi. All the metros now going on in the country. There are 13 cities having metro construction now going on. And all these metros, the initial investigations and studies, preparation of the detailed project report, funding, deciding on the funding pattern, obtaining government's clearance, all this was done by Delhi Metro because we had mastered the technology, we had mastered the expertise for planning and, ex and implementing metro projects. We were able to bring in a virtual metro revolution in the country. This is what I call technical competence. You must learn. If you know your job well, again that gives you so much of confidence, so much of Self-assurance. If you really don't know yourself, you can hire people to start with to help you. But you should know the job very well. Ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> our Sastra <coughs> say, Jnana Meva Paramam Bela. If you know, that gives you a lot of strength. It also says, Jnanena Sadarsam Pavitran Ikhana Vidyate. There is nothing so divine as knowledge in this, in this world. Knowledge is so important. Knowledge gives you, as I told you, a lot of self confidence. And if you, you know your job well, people will not interfere in your way of working. I had to work in government really with four state governments and the government of India. In <coughs> Delhi, I had to work with Delhi government as well as government of India and all the politicians of any <coughs> eminence, they are all available in Delhi to interfere in your work. But because <laughs> they knew that the organization which was handling this work was very competent, they never venture, they are to interfere in our work at all.
this is the importance of knowing your job very well. I remember an incident in Delhi Metro in the early stages, where according to the detailed project report, the alignment was to a particular area. We found that taking the alignment along that area, far too many houses had to be demolished and a lot of lands at very exorbitant cost had to be hired. So I debated that alignment a little bit, took it generally through railway land, avoiding a lot of land acquisitions and demolitions. The public were against it. They said, no, you cannot shift the alignment. It should be as per the original alignment itself, because they are expecting not a compensation if the alignment is taken along that way. And Srimadhi, Srila Dixit, was the chief minister. She held a meeting. She called me also for the meeting. I still remember the words she uttered to the public. She told them that as far as the alignment is concerned, I entirely have, I have full confidence in the competence of my engineers who will decide it correctly. I'm not going to change it. The public all came in, came thinking that being a politician, she would change the alignment. She said no. But I do understand you have certain problems right, because the alignment is changed. And that problem I will tackle, but I will not insist on the alignment to be changed. You see, that confidence in your work, you are able to <coughs> demonstrate by only by your technical competence. This is so important. Knowing your work very well. I need not go very much in detail about the need for knowing your work very well. On this, in this context, I want to tell <coughs> the, the students here: you are very lucky to have your education, technical education, in an institution of this type, excellent institution. But please remember. This institution will give you only the basic foundation for the technical knowledge and experience that you want. Later on, you have to build up on this foundation through experience, observation. Please remember, for an engineer, education is a lifelong pursuit. I want to repeat it. Education is a lifelong pursuit throughout your career. You have to go on learning. You see, you want observing things. Any opportunity that you get, observe things. Find out how it is to be done. Even if you go, happen to go to a railway platform, see a foot-off bridge, immediately start thinking, what is the theory behind this foot-off bridge design? How has it been designed? This inquisitiveness all the time. And the spirit of innovation, improving matters. These are very important for any engineer. Please remember this. Not only that, <coughs> you see, knowledge gives you also humility. Vidya, the Dadi, Vinayam. I am often drawn by this quoting in Sanskrit, you should excuse me. Vidya Dadi Vinayam. If you know the knowledge, you know that gives you humility, that gives you confidence. <coughs> it is a pot full of water, it will not spill if it is full. If it is only half, you know, only it makes a lot of noise. This is essential for any engineer. And the fourth thing which I mentioned was social responsibility or social accountability. As I mentioned, we are all very fortunate to have the formal technical education in institutions of this type. This is not merely to give you a career, not merely to give you a job to get a salary. This is to train you 
to have an opportunity to serve the country. You have responsibility for the country, for the fellow men, for the society. And this is that opportunity is given to you today. This is a social responsibility that you should shoulder from the portals of this institution, wherever you go, that you have to serve your country, you have to serve your fellow men in the society. In these projects, what we realized was the first social responsibility for us was to complete the projects on time, complete the projects within the estimated cost. That is our first social responsibility, which we knew, which we understood, and which we implemented. Then another thing is, when you execute projects at this time, you cause minimum dislocation, minimum inconvenience to the public at large, to the people. I mentioned to you about Calcutta Metro. What a chaos is created when the Calcutta Metro was being implemented. But when Delhi Metro was being implemented, people never knew that a tunnel was being bored through under their offices or under the residences. So quietly we were doing it. We were using special high-tech tunnel boring machines for that purpose. And whenever we took up a road for construction of an elevated section, we ensured that the traffic is properly looked after. We installed additional signals, we diverted the traffic necessary, and we put our own men to control the traffic. We did not depend on the traffic police. In fact, Delhi public used to say, that though so many streets were being taken up for construction, they said the traffic was moving much better when the Delhi metro construction was going on rather than earlier. That is how we managed. <laughs> this is a social responsibility. The other social responsibility was greenery, cutting trees. Projects of this type, you have to cut many trees. It's unavoidable. But we decided on our own, and mind you, there were no instructions, there were no guidance, there is no stipulation by the government. We decided that for every tree that we cut, we will plant 10 trees as compensatory afforestation. <laughs> this is a social responsibility. Then the works were being done, we ensured that we don't use, uh, create too much of vibration, too much of noise. We selected machinery of that type that people can sleep quietly during the night. There is no problem. We should see that the public are not put in convenience. <coughs> Even when you are digging up roads and all that, we put proper barricades to screen the work sites from the public view. We kept the road screen all the time. And for that purpose, you'll be surprised to know, from every work site before the vehicles come out, the tires used to be cleaned with water so that the slush and mud from the work site is not spilled on the road surface. Even after that, every night we used to sweep the roads well or clean the roads with water to see that they are kept very clean and tidy. This is a social responsibility. Whenever you execute a project, see that the project does not cause any problem. When Congress Railway really was being constructed, we had to acquire land from 44,000 people. Can you imagine? It's 160 kilometer long line. About 44,000 people, we had to acquire the land or their houses or the place of business. Every individual we met personally explain to him the importance of this project and how even one day still that this project is going to cost the whole nation so much of extra money, we used to explain to them and canvas the support and sympathy for the project. With the result, you will be surprised to know 95% of the land we could take over in within 12 months of starting the work. And for that, we should we ensure that the people were not put to difficulties. If somebody's house was to be demolished, 
We used to tell him, ship this family to another house. We used to pay the rent for that house till he's able to find his own accommodation. We used to disband his house and allow him to take away all <coughs> retrieval items of doors, windows, tiles, transport it at our cost to his new location to help him to build his new house. A very <laughs> we did not go by the usual rules and regulations of the Land Acquisition Act. We had a very proactive attitude to see that people are helped when what was going on. This is social responsibility. Ladies and gentlemen, an engineer should realize that he is not for himself. He is not for the society, for the whole nation. And he should not go by what remuneration he gets. That is very, 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 it's a secondary thing. The important thing is what opportunity he gets to do service to society or to the nation. This is your outlook. This should be your motive. All the time. All the time. Why is that even at this last stage of my life, I am, I am nearing 86 this June, why am I still working? Is it for salary? Is it for reward, recognition, or reputation? Certainly not. This only, I feel, gives me an opportunity to do something for the country all the time. A little later, I will explain to you what are the other side activities that I have, serving the society, serving the nation. This should be your attitude all the time. Don't bother about what salary. See, during the placement, you are only bothered about what salary, who is taking you, and all that. That is, according to me, is not at all important. You know, the count should be, am I getting a good opportunity to do something good for my country, for my society, to the humanity? That should be your outlook, not your pay package, compensation that you will get. That is subsidiary. That money will be simply lying in the bank account. You may not even use it. You may leave this world leaving the money behind. That is not important. You have to change your outlook in regard to remuneration and <coughs> the profits of <coughs> your service. For the young <coughs> students present here, there are two other things which I want to make very important. You should understand that an engineering <clears throat> profession is a very demanding profession, particularly in regard to health. It is so essential to have excellent, robust health for any engineer. If you want to perform well, if you want to do your duty, perform your duties properly, if you don't want to be a source of concern to your parents or to your spouses, you must have good health. You must build up good health all the time. It is so easy to have good health, provided you have a disciplined life. <coughs> the Bhagavad Gita says, for good health, yukta hara viharasya, yukta jaitasvakarmani, yukta sapna abhautasya, <coughs> The Sapta Avavadasya Yogo Bhavati Dukkaha. It's moderation in everything, whether in your food habits, whether in your recreational facilities, whether even spending your time for your work, you must be moderate all the time. Even in your sleep, even your your uh, dreams, everything moderation is required. Then you go bhavati dukkaha. Then you get what is known as dukkha means you won't have any sort of a grief. And you have yoga. Yoga means what? Bhagavad Gita says 
samatam yoga vichade, which is equalness in everything that is yoga. I am quoting Bhagavad Gita because I am an ardent devotee of Bhagavad Gita. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Bhagavad Gita is not a religious text. As usually understood by all people, they think it's a text only for Hindus. It is not. Bhagavad Gita is, Bhagavad Gita is nothing but a conversation that has taken place on the battlefield of Kurukshetra by Lord Krishna and the King Arjuna. It is from one administrator to another administrator. administrator. How to perform his duties properly? What are his duties? This is, so the Bhagavad Gita is not a religious test. It is, I would say, a management manual, a management gospel, which is Bhagavad Gita. This conversation in Kurukshetra took place 5,135 years back. You may wonder how I arrived at this 5,155 years. I have not invented that. This was found out by the 5th century mathematician of this country, Aryabhatta. You must have heard about Aryabhatta, who invented the concept of pi. Pi means the ratio between the circle friends and the diameter of a circle. He gifted this concept to the whole world in 5th century, Pi. He calculated and found out that Bhagavad Gita took this, this, this war, Mahabharata war, took place in 3127 BC. He arrived at that. From that only I have that Bhagavad Gita took place 5135 years back. Even after nearly 5100 years, the teachings of the Bhagavad Gita is so important, so helpful. He used to always come back and open Bhagavad Gita and he could always find one verse which would give him the required confidence and strength to move forward. This is what Bhagavad Gita does. So I will be very often quoting to you from Bhagavad Gita because <clears throat> I think for any engineer, Bhagavad Gita is really a, a, a gospel. How to do your duty properly? What is that you should expect from the duty? And what are the ways you should do it? These are all very important. In this context, at least two points in Bhagavad Gita I want to tell so particular, so important, and so relevant to an engineer. What is a swatik, a righteous duty, and who is a righteous performer. Bhagavad Gita gives it so precisely and so well. He says, Niyadam Sangarahidam Araga Dveshata Akritam Abhala Krepsuna Karma Yetat Swatikam Uchade. When you say Swatikam, I hope you understand. It is attitude, righteousness. What is a righteous way of doing a duty? He says, Nenam Sankarahidam. Nenam means what is ordained, what is your, whatever duty is assigned to you. You should do it without any attachment. Then, Araga Dveshvakrtham, without any like or dislike. You may not like the dog, but don't go on cursing your boss for it. Or you know a particular part of the work and do only that part of the work and not the rest of it. This is Araga thought. Apala Prakshana Karma, that is most important. You perform your duty without expecting any recognition, any reward. And that duty is called Sattvic duty. That is the righteous way of doing things. And who is a righteous performer? That also Bhagavad Gita says. Mukta Sango Anahamvadi. 
व्यक्ति उत्साह समन्वित रहा मृत संगोत्साह समन्वित रहा सिद्धि 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 और निर्विकार रहा कर्ता स्वाति का मुच्छ दे मॉरल सेम थिंग इसे मुक्त संगो विदाउट एनी अटैचमेंट टू द ड्यूटी दैट यू आर परफॉर्मिंग अनहम बॉडी डोंट टेक इन प्राइड दैट आई एम केपेबल ऑफ इट आई एम डूइंग दैट डोंट हैव दैट प्राइड दैट ईगो ऑल द टाइम विच यू व्यक्ति उत्साह समन्वित रहा perform it with dexterity discipline that is important with diligence dexterity and diligence perform your duty then siddhi siddhi or nirvikara you should not be bothered about whether it gets good results or bad results you should try always for good results but if you don't get it you are not going to go and go and hang yourself You should try to rectify, it, to do something, to make it good. Such a performer is sadhik performers. In engineer's life, the sattva gana is so important. Rectitude, righteousness is so important. Sattva gana. And how do you get sattva gana? From the institution of this type? Yes, this institution gives. It's a very unique institution. With because of the amass <coughs> culture, the organization's culture, you have certain good values instilled in you. For that, Sri Mad Bhagavatam says, "Sattvaniya vasevedi, puman sattva vivardhaniye, tado dharma tado tyanam." Yavas Pradi Apohanam. In short, it means if you want to have Sattva Guna, righteous character, you should always think of righteous things, always good, think of good things, and then you will get Dharma and you will get Jnana. This is important. For an engineer, these things are pursuing these values are so important. Ladies and gentlemen, many of you may not know that I wear two hats. One, the hat of a metro man, helping many metros in the country. Most of the metros now going on are all planned and <coughs> evaluated and implement, getting implemented under my guidance. Most of the metros in the country today, metro man. I have another hat. That is, the president of a non-government organization (NGO) called Foundation for Restoration of National Values. That's why I'm here today. This country, after 70 years of independence, where are we? As a nation, we should be ashamed. I would say. Often I wonder whether we have become a failed nation at all. Seventy years of independence, still forty percent of our population live below poverty line. A large section of our people still don't have the basic necessities of life: clean drinking water, <coughs> good. Cleanliness in their homes and their surroundings. Cleanliness, housing, proper education, and most important, health cover. We don't have still. Why? You take many other nations of the world who have become independent now, much later than us, much later than us, who have got independent. <coughs> They are all now very developed nations, thriving so well. Take the nation, take country like Germany, Japan. They were completely blown to the dust during the World War II, 45. We got our independence 47. Within 30 years, they bounced back, and they became leading countries of the nation, the whole world. 
Singapore. Singapore got its independence only in 1967, much like 20 years after us. See how the country is today. South Korea, again, it got independence from the Japanese and Chinese occupation only uh, 1968, I think. It has become the, the, the sixth <coughs> economic power in the, country, in the world today. Why is it our country alone is in this fashion? All because we have lost the values, the culture, the ethos, the principles which this country was very bold, very proud of about 300 years back. We have a terrible, we have a very holy heritage. See, heritage like Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam, Mahabharata, what sort of things we have. But on the way we have lost all the values. Today what you see around, this institution may be an exception, but I see other educational institutions, Kerala, one should be ashamed of it, what is happening. I have studied in government Victoria College, Palgat. Do you know about five years back, when the principal of the college was retiring, on that day, the students agitated and burned his effigy. In this way, you respect your teachers. Why have we lost our values? Maharaja's College is another very eminent institution in Kerala. On a day when the principal, uh, that too, a lady principal was away from the college, her chair was taken out and burned by the students. The students have no respect for the teachers. The teachers have no concern for the students. The parents have no time for the, for the children. And the political elements are holding the host in the educational institutions Canada today. If you see the standard of engineering education in the country today, all of us engineers would be really feel ashamed. In 2016, a survey was done about the quality of engineering education in the country. I'm not mentioning about institutions like IITs, NITs, this one, or BITS, Berlin Institute of Technology, etc. Generally, 6,500 colleges were surveyed, about 3 lakh students were interviewed, and they come to the conclusion that engineering students coming out of these colleges, only 20% are readily employable. 20% only readily employable. Another 20% can be made employable by further killing or further education. And the rest are just not employable. See the standard of education in the country. India does not have even one university to rank among the 100 years leading universities of the world. We don't have even one university to rank in that. Now only IAS is just inching, in, inching into this list. Why our education has gone to this standard? We are not our values. So this FR and the Foundation for the Restoration of National Values, we are trying to revive these values, bring back the old values of the country. At least instill respect for the country, instill respect for our constitution, instill respect for our national flag, be proud of an Indian, that is necessary. So I am these days very much involved in the Sephar media activities as well. And of course, our main aim is to instill the values in the children, in the education institutions. Value education in all schools, education institutions. I find this value education is, in, is required even in high technical institutions like this. The engineers should know what values they have to practice when they go out. The subject alone is not enough. Unless you know the law, the, you have the language, the knowledge, and you practice the knowledge with certain values and principles, it has no meaning. This has got to be done. Dear students, 
you should understand the crown and glory of life is character. You must have good character. There are certain things in life on which you have no control. Like you, you can't choose your complexion. You can't remold your facial features. You can't increase your height. There are certain things you can't do anything. But there are certain things you can definitely mold. They are your health. You can have your own command. You can control the way you, you, you have your health. And you can also mold your character. Fortunately, you are in situations of this type which gives high stress importance to good character, good behavior. See that you invite these good values from this institution, and when you go out and you become successful in career, please don't forget this institution, your alma mater. Whatever you are able to contribute to an institution like this, my service, financially, whatever it is, please do so. Don't forget your alma mater. Finally, as I said, I want to again lay stress on your character, on your conduct. You must have the, <coughs> the character excellence, I would say. The behavior majesty, the way you behave, people should know as yes, they are from this, with, with their freedom. They should understand this. The behavior majesty. And the interaction elegance. When you deal with people, that elegance should come out. Dear students, you have got an excellent opportunity to imbibe all these values. And please don't waste your time. Thank you very much.